Okay, well, welcome everyone. So this portion of the day's events involves the study of the Buddha's teaching. Study of the Buddha's teaching is for the purpose of putting the Buddha's teaching into practice. We don't study the Buddha's teaching for intellectual edification or curiosity, philosophy. We study the Buddha's teaching to put it into practice. So our words are important, our words must be directed to actual practice. Speech is an important, one of the fundamental qualities of what makes us who we are, what we say. What we do, what we say, what we think, these are the three things that make up who we are. And so when we speak, we should speak the Dhamma, try to speak what is useful, what is helpful. So it will be directed towards the practice of the Buddhist teaching. However, there being many ways to approach the practice of the Buddha's teaching, we can also take the opportunity to uh, appreciate the significance of this day. So today is significant as being a commemoration of the passing of Ron Folks, who has great importance uh, to us indirectly as an organization through his uh, his connection and his belief in the goodness of uh, our host and an important member of our community, Jeff Bao Nguyen. And so we come together to honor and commemorate his passing because of in the recognition of his belief and, and devotion to Jeff as uh, giving him the means to uh, make use of his wealth and his resources in a way that uh, he knew Jeff would and his his uh, confidence and his uh, his knowledge that Jeff would put it, it to good use. So we appreciate because that aligns with what we believe to be good and it has allowed us to uh, fulfill our goals in a way that we never thought uh, or we, we, we weren't sure would ever be, be possible. So there is a, a, an alignment of our uh, views and our goals that relate to Ron folks. So as a commemoration of a person who has passed away, it is uh, useful and practical. It is possible to connect the practice of the Buddha's teaching to an understanding of death. Death is a topic that we normally are reluctant to talk about, something that we shy away from. We often may even try to ignore and 
forget about the existence or the reality of death that all beings will die, that everyone in this room will die. We don't want to talk about that. We don't want to hear about it. We don't want to think about it. Everyone we love, our parents, our children, sometimes even our children may die before we die. All of our friends, all of our enemies. Death is common to all. And so it, it, on the one hand, makes a sort of a taboo subject, one that we would rather not talk about. But on the other hand, it becomes all the more important because of the trauma surrounding death. There can be great sadness, there can be great suffering, both for the person who dies and for those who are left behind, those who experience the loss of a loved one. So, the first type of death to talk about, in Buddhism we recognize there are three types of death. And this death that we're talking about now is only one of the three types. It's called samuti marana. Death as a concept, death of a being. When we say this person died or that person died, that's called samuti marana. Because it's not real. Whether you believe in reincarnation, rebirth, or the, the um, further birth uh, of a being who has passed away, the reality is that we only talk about the death of a being. We don't experience it. And we only understand it based on our memories. We have experiences of the person who passed away. And now we don't have those experiences anymore. So we, in our mind, have the idea that this person is gone. Now, that's not to trivialize it. The death of a being is, is a profound event. It's just to understand that it's only one way of looking at the situation. But in regards to a person who has passed away, first, as a sort of basic fundamental practice it's a part of our coming to terms with the nature of our existence as impermanent as uh, unstable unstable so the first thing we should do when someone passes away is give attention to our perceptions of the loss, which is a fancy way of saying we have to grieve and we have to cultivate wisdom and understanding about the grieving process. We have to understand the nature of loss, the nature of grief, and at best we have to find a way to let go and to free ourselves from the suffering. The suffering not of loss, but of change. Because loss is a conceptual idea based on the idea that we ever owned anything. We make all sorts of connections in our mind. I, I am the father, the mother of this person, I am the husband, the wife, the brother, the sister. These have meaning to us. They don't have meaning in reality. In reality, all we have is experiences. In reality, the experiences, the good experiences, the bad experiences we've had with other people, we don't lose them when the person dies. Those experiences have already happened. All we lose is the uh, potential to get what we want because of our attachments to people and our attachments to experiences.
So an important part of Buddhist practice is the uh, adaptability that comes from understanding the nature of change. To not see things as loss, but as change. Because the truth about death is, even for the person who dies, it's only a change. And for us, who are left behind, all it means is a change. It only shows us that our attachments to individuals are, are a flawed way of living our lives. The idea that only life is only acceptable with this person or that person. The idea of, of preferring this person's company to that person's company or a, any person's company to being alone or being alone to being in someone else's company. These kinds of preference are, are flawed, futile, deluded. They, they misunderstand and, and fail to appreciate the inherent aspect of change, impermanence. Everything changes. Nothing lasts forever, and if that thing that didn't last forever becomes something you require, are dependent upon, then you only lead yourself to suffering. So coming to terms with loss, change, a person's death is a very important practice and it's a big part of not just a person's death but this ability to become independent not dependent on things staying the same or dependent on change or this change, that change is a big part of mindfulness which teaches us to confront and face and be at peace regardless of what we experience. The second thing we should do is respect and appreciate the person who has passed away. Because, yes, in, in an ultimate sense we can say the person doesn't exist, it's just a concept. But concepts don't negate the existence. They just help us to understand there's a greater depth to the nature of reality. So the truth is that when people, the people who have died, they did, they did live. The only thing we understand is that there's a deeper reality to people, that people are not static, solid entities. It doesn't mean we can't appreciate or shouldn't appreciate their good qualities. And that's an important thing to do when a person passes, even when the Buddha passed away. It was a big thing to, to of course, collect and continue to practice his teachings. So when a person passes, we think of all the good things they did, their good qualities, and we try to um, respect them, try to emulate them, try to ensure that they be carried on and that that person's inclinations and, and uh, the good intentions. Sometimes if they had some bad intentions, you might uh, kind of brush those aside. You don't have to carry those on and you just forgive them those, of course, and let go of them, but the good things of people we respect and, and we, we honor them. The third thing you do for someone who passes, when, when someone passes away, not for them, much more for yourself, is you remind yourself with the death of another person that all beings die, that I too will get old, sick and die. The death of a person is profound. That person is not here anymore. They never will be again. They will never be again. That person is gone. 
And that's profound. That, of course, shakes you, shakes people up and is, for many people, very hard to come to terms with. Because it is so absolute. And the reminder that that's going to happen to us as well. This person who I cling to, who I, I think is a good person, or I, I feel self-conscious about, I, I, I don't like myself, I like myself. This self isn't permanent. This being is going to disappear without a trace. Nobody's going to see them again. And this is helpful, very useful. Useful in, in the way that so many uh, aspects of reality are useful because it's real. It's a part of reality that we neglect to appreciate. We uh, overlook, and so we cling to ourselves, and we uh, have goals for ourselves, and want to make ourselves up to be this or be that, without paying attention to the fact that everything we build up will be torn down. These are three important aspects for helping us deal with loss, but also important ways of uh, understanding the significance of death in terms of the practice of the Buddhist teaching. The second type of death is called samucheda marana. So when a person dies, as I said, it's just a change for them. Nothing really dies. They just continue on. But there is a kind of death that is significant, that has greater significance for the person, for the individual. Death might see, a death of a being might seem significant because it, it has the potential to lead to a very different kind of life. A human who dies can be reborn as a, an animal, can be born as a ghost, can be born in hell, can be born as, as a deva in heaven. So it might seem very significant. And, and of course, it, it is practically very, uh, a very serious matter, considering how profound the change could be. However, that being said, whatever experiences you have in the future are still going to be dependent upon your state of mind, dependent upon your attachment. So where you are born will be dependent on whether you have strong greed, strong anger, strong delusion, or whether you have strong mindfulness, strong kindness, strong friendliness, compassion, and so on. What are the qualities of your mind? And beyond that, birth itself, the continuation, can only come about because of those states. So without them, without strong greed, strong anger, strong delusion, you can never be born as an animal, as a ghost, or in hell. You can never have the danger of having a profoundly negative shift in, in your experience. You just won't be born there, not without those strong defilements. So, since we're not concerned about getting rid of the good states, we focus very much on these bad states, and we can say a very significant type of death, samucheda marana, is the death of cutting off, the death of defilement. And most importantly, the death of ignorance, by which all other defilements are given the ability to arise. Without ignorance... You could never get angry or greedy or deluded. What that means is if you had wisdom, if you understand those things that you normally react to with anger, greed, delusion, you just couldn't get angry or greedy or deluded about them. It's just not possible without ignorance. Wisdom just prevents you, even if you 
you, you could never even think to. It just cannot happen. So this points to us how important it is to train our minds, to cultivate and to facilitate our minds' uh, change and, and, and freedom from ignorance, to cultivate wisdom. And again, we're not talking about intellectual wisdom, but wisdom as in understanding the things that make you angry, the things that you cling to with greed, and the delusion of arrogance and conceit and wrong views and all that. And this, of course, involves the practice of meditation. So the bridge, you could say the bridge between these two types of death, conceptual death and, and the death of defilements, the real breaking free from the cycle of suffering, is the third type of death, kanika marana. Kanika marana is death at every moment. Every moment of every day we are born and die. Because we, what we call we, is ultimately only our experiences. Our seeing, our hearing, our smelling, our tasting, our feeling, our thinking. Think, look at what, what's happening to you right now, sitting here. There's so much of your experience right now is dependent on sound. Hearing me talk. Because no matter how you try, you're going to be confronted you can't escape the sound of my voice. So that's going to be a big part of your experience. And it's only because of those experiences that many things arise. Thoughts, maybe you like what you hear, maybe you don't like what you hear. Maybe it makes you think about something else. But those are real experiences. They happen in your mind. There's going to be experiences maybe of pain in your body. And those are real. Those come. They arise. When you feel the pain, the pain is born. When the pain goes away, the pain has died. When you hear the sound of my voice, the, ex the hearing experience is born. When my voice stops, the hearing experience is gone. And there's more experiences, thinking about it, reflecting on it, processing what you've heard. Many, many different types of experience, but each one arises and ceases, is born and dies. And this might seem somewhat insignificant, somewhat meaningless. What does this have to do with my life and what I want and, and my, my peace and my happiness? These moments of experience are the cause of your happiness and the cause of your suffering. All the time, everything you do, whether you are working, whether you are studying, whether you are playing games, whether you are talking, whether you are listening, whether you are eating, whether you are drinking, urinating, defecating, sleeping, standing, sitting. Behind all of the things you do, there are moments of experience. You will see something, and when you see something, you like it, or you will hear something and you don't like it, or you smell or taste. These moments are what gives rise to our greed, our anger and our delusion and everything that could absolutely ever possibly cause us suffering. They are happening here and now. Even here and now you might find greed arising, anger arising, delusion arising, and they arise in reality based on these experiences. It is crucial that we take these momentary births and deaths as our object in meditation and that we cultivate understanding so that we look at these things not as me, mine, good, bad or anything that would trigger greed, anger and delusion but we see them as moments of arising and ceasing something not to be clung on to not to be greedy about or angry about but as experiences and to be understood and when we understand the experiences 
We understand that they're impermanent. So we don't cling to them to be permanent. We understand them because they're impermanent, they're not satisfying. So we don't cling to them as satisfying. And as non-self, we see that they are not me, they are not mine. They're momentary. And so we let go of them. The practice of mindfulness isn't very complicated. It's much more about removing the complications. We have a complicated relationship with so many things. Complicated relationship with food. Well, there's food that's good for us, that's part of it, but there's also food we like. And sometimes food we like is not food that's good for us, and so we suffer. Or we get food that we don't like, but it's good for us, and so we suffer. People, we have complex relationships. Mindfulness makes our relationships with reality much simpler. Seeing is just seeing. Hearing is just hearing. Pain is just pain. Thinking is just thinking. Liking, disliking, seeing them as they are gives us this perspective, this ability to let go, to dwell independent of reality. So this momentary death, this is what we focus on in mindfulness practice and this is the ultimately what allows us to come to terms with a person's death come to terms with our own mortality and come to terms with our uh, the birth of defilements and the continual and ever-present danger of falling into greed, anger, and delusion, which we free ourselves from let, by letting go through the death of the defilements. So that's the Dhamma for today. That's what I wanted to talk about. I have to uh, meet with meditators soon. So I'm going to let Jeff uh, lead you in walking and sitting meditation. And I wish you all a good day. Thank you all for coming and I appreciate the kindness and generosity, the thoughtfulness, the dedication and devotion to the Buddha's teaching. And I wish for you all to find peace, happiness and freedom from suffering. Thank you. <laughs>